Well, good morning. It's uh, Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. And this is uh, Staff Sergeant Rutluski Robert Allen, also known as Rob Ryder. And we're going to talk today about the IRS Form 1098 and its use in lender deception and tax evasion by the people who claim to have given you a loan, um, a mortgage, let's say. And this never happened. And uh, I've been showing this over my last couple of videos. And this is just a continuation. But first, uh, I am Rob Ryder, R-O-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R, and my email is courtofrecord at AOL.com, and you can find my videos on Rob Ryder, with three B's, R-O-B-B-B-R-Y-D-E-R, -B -B -E on YouTube. So let's go there just for a second, take a look. Uh, my last couple of videos had to do with deceptive practices, and uh, what I've been showing, if this is your first video, is... Um, if you go and get certain documents to have to do with the mortgage for your property, any homeowner, so you don't have to be in foreclosure, this is happening to all of y'all that own land or believe you own land, uh, you know, you're being screwed. And only you can do something about it. So I'm doing videos showing you where you can find the information, but you're going to have to do the complaining. And I certainly wish that uh, people would start doing it instead of just sitting here watching videos. Of somebody doing somebody else's, just to use as an example. So, uh, let's look at a few things, and uh, I need a second to get started. Hang on. So, just for a quick review, if you were to find your closing disclosure, and uh, let's say you don't have it, don't know where it is, well, call who's ever the servicer for your loan. Right? But you can find this thing from somebody, and all this stuff is online now, so they can just email it to you. And when you get it, you'll find out, well, they had a settlement agent, and they have a file, and you had a lender, and they have a file. And it uh, looks like they actually have two files, so why don't we get copies of these files and see what they have to say? And that's what we were doing, and uh, finding all sorts of errors and omissions and things. And Well, since then... Uh, so one of the things is on this, then if you go down to the, I think it's the fifth page. Yeah, there it is, sixth page. Uh, you have contact information, right? So these are all the players involved in your transaction. And, you know, if they had a license, it says they have a license. Or it's got a number there. Now, do they have a license or not? This is the things that you find out by going and checking. And you can Google this thing called N. MLS, and uh, it's a national site where all these um, licenses are supposed to be, you know, registered, and put in these numbers and get information off, and I've shown that in the last couple of videos, more than I guess in the last video than maybe the first, but one of the things that was found is that, like this Lisa Alonzo, well, she doesn't have a license, Right? There is somebody that has those two parts of a name in a name, but that's not the name on the license. And this name, Lisa Alonzo, isn't one of the aliases on the form, which specifically says, what other names do you use? And she has other names listed, but there's no Lisa Alonzo. So Lisa Alonzo does not have a fucking license, period. Well, you could say the same thing, really, about the... Um, lender as far as the parts they're going to get involved in but that's for a little bit down the road this is what we're working on right now the lender stuff but what we had done before was because with the broker you have a signed contract it's one of the few forms you're going to find that both you and somebody else signed and in one case it's you and the broker in another case it's you and the seller and those documents are all under the broker and so we're taking the broker to small claims court because in the agreement it said that uh, you know closing was defined by the legal title being transferred to the purchaser well the purchaser never got the legal title as again you have to watch the videos to see all the pieces of paper that'll prove it to you um and it, you know because the, the title isn't the warranty deed the title is a map or a survey that has on it, you know, here's the square. It's all closed in. It, it defines how much territory there is in the square. It's got an arrow pointing to the square. This is where we're talking about. And it has someplace on the form, right, that 
the owner is, and it has the owner's name on it. So if that was your property, it would have your name on it. But we don't have these with our names on it. Right? They didn't transfer that title to her. They didn't do a new survey and give it to the homeowner to say that they were the owner. Well, so it never happened. So that's what we're took in the court for. Now we took him to small claims court for the thirty eight hundred dollars of earnest money that they were responsible for because they're acting as your agent, so I'm saying they're responsible for it. With the idea being that we're really not trying to go to court, we're trying to get them to um settle outside of court. Because uh, deceptive practice is a crime. So even though it's a small claims court, if it's a deceptive practice and the judge agrees, then the person we're talking about committed a crime. Well, that's a whole other Ricky Lake show for you know, getting your relief. But at least now you have a judge that agreed with you. Right? Step one. Um, so then there's the Universal Title Company, who's a settlement agent, who was also acting as the agent for the uh, title insurance company. So they're not the title insurance company, but they were acting as the agent of the title insurance company. Or they were, say that they were. And part of the deal was that they were supposed to send a commitment from the title insurance company with the, you know, the terms and conditions of the insurance, basically. And while they did send a piece of paper that at the top calls itself a, commitment it has places on there where they were supposed to sign that they didn't sign so it's not a commitment it's just a piece of paper calling itself a commitment you know it's a simulated legal process or at least a simulated business process and as you can see the applicant didn't sign it and so forth and so on but you know so these are the places you contact each of these people that's involved say hey you'd like a copy of whatever they have to do with this transaction and they're pretty good about sending you something. I don't know that we've gotten everything, but we've gotten paper from everybody so far. And uh, as I said, we opened a small claims case. And so now what's happened is um, they've been served and come to find out the real estate broker, some you know, real broker LLC is some entity out of New York City. And so their New York City attorney called the homeowner, and they've had a conversation, and, you know, whoever it was on the phone said, well, I'm only authorized to sell it for $500. So Kimberly said, well, we'll see you in court. And they're supposed to file an answer by March 6th, which is sometime this week. Is it not? Yeah, today's the third. And so not that this ever shows you much, but this is the justice court, and uh, it's got the case number. So, I mean... Anybody who wants to follow along and see what's happening, there's the case number. 2451-000-54-894. Yeah, 54894. There you go. And this shows now, which is a brand new thing, right, that uh, the service return had happened. So... Kimberly gets this phone call, uh, actually got a message from this attorney saying they had, were calling and, um, as their attorney, real broker LLC, and uh, that they had been served and wanted to talk to her. Well, we went and looked at this form. There, had, there was still nothing on here. There was no, nothing about a service return being on there. But basically what happened is uh, on the 14th is the day that... Uh, the case was filed, and by the 22nd, actually by the 20th, I believe, they were calling Kimberly, so they got served within a week. And now that we've complained, hey, there's nothing on this docket showing what happened, um, they've put in that the service return happened. Which kind of led to this email here that uh, Kimberly had complained, hey, how come this stuff hasn't shown up in the docket? And she got an email that uh, from... This person here, uh, the chief clerk of the judge, this person here. 
I personally reviewed the case. It's been successfully updated. The service attorneys will not be scanned, blah, blah, blah. Going on and give a reason why stuff isn't in there. Uh, if you need uh, additional assistance, please do not hesitate to contact the court. So, you know, in my mind, these things all mean something. And, you know, the court isn't the court building and it's not the clerk. The court is the judge. Or it's at least the judge and the clerk together, right? That, uh, so this is like an invitation to contact the judge. Or, in this case, because you read down, so now she put her uh, signature block, right? And it says, Chief Clerk, comma, JP for Judge Gar uh, Garcia. Well, hang on a minute. Now, this is a Justice of the Peace Court. Or Justice of the Peace, not a Justice of the Peace Court necessarily, but Justice of the Peace, Precinct 5, Place 1. This this person here, Carpellino, is actually the JP, the way this reads, Chief Clerk, JP for the judge. Because a Justice of the Peace is not the same office as a judge. They're two different offices. And so you want to talk to the Justice of the Peace, this is the person to talk to. Not the judge in that precinct, but this person here, the JP, the Chief Clerk. JP for the judge. And so, you know, we're going to write them back or write her back and, uh, you know, get some more information. See what else they'll tell us. But I just happened to notice this, you know, once you got this uh, letter back. And so you all can decide for yourself, what is Chief Clerk, comma, JP for Judge Garcia mean? What is a JP? I say it's Justice of the Peace. And it's just the piece for the judge. Right? Like, uh, you know, just the piece. Is that more like maybe like an administrative office? Because back in the day in England, the king had justices of the peace. They were the king, but they were the king's officers. They really weren't in the court. They were working for the king. Right? And then they had justices in the higher courts and so forth, but like at the lower level, right, they were justices of the peace. But all these justices at the different level are all the same, I guess that's how it works, they're all the same office, they just have different territorial jurisdictions. But a justice is not the same as a judge. Period. Okay. Just before we get to the IRS stuff, because I'd already talked about it, right? Here's what a commitment's supposed to look like. Commitment for title insurance. And what does it say at the very beginning? The following commitment for title insurance is not valid unless your name and the policy amount are shown in Schedule A and our authorized representative has countersigned below. And it's blank. So you don't have to go any further about any other paperwork. This isn't done, right? It's like, never happened. So that's, you know, title insurance fraud. And that's through the title company, and that's somebody you haven't gotten to yet, but this just goes to show that every place you look at this paperwork, you find these errors. And we got this paperwork because, you know, we looked at the closing statement and said, well, let's contact these people and ask for all the paperwork they have. Well, we did the same with the lender, Wallach and Volk, and they sent a bunch of stuff and been going through that. And at the uh, and out of that, we've uh, come to understand that through the uh, Texas regulatory regulatory agency over finances, whatever the proper name of it is, that you can file a complaint about stuff with them also, which we have. So we may not have to go to small claims court. We're going to go to the state court and see if we can get uh, state administrative board. And they've already answered with a snarky answer that we're going to rebut. And so that'll all be for another video. I'm just saying these are all things that happen once you get this information and start looking and say, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And that's what we're going to look at now. What was some of the wrong stuff we found in the paperwork that we got from the lender? And at the same time, just because of the time of year it was, um, this form you know, became an issue because it's a mortgage interest statement. So anybody who owns a property is probably getting one of these about now or has already gotten one from your lender. And, uh, well, 
I'm going to show you what's wrong with it, right? And so what I'm saying, before we go any further, is you should send it back. Say, hey, this is wrong. Redo it and send it back. I don't accept the form. Right? That's what you do. You tell me to fix it, or I'm going to take you to court for deceptive practice and send it back to it. And I'm going to show you why. But first of all, this is if you go look online, you're going to find the IRS form 1098. And you'll see it has an OMB number on it in a particular revision. So this is like, you know, this is the form. It doesn't look like this. It's an altered form. And I don't believe you can alter forms that have OMB numbers on them because that's why it has the number. It's, you know, locked in the system. This is what they had to use, this form right here. And so it's got recipient lender and uh, recipient's 10, payers 10, name, street address, city, town. You know, it looks pretty standard. Like, how could you mess this thing up? Well, now let's look at the one that they sent the borrower. Right? Where it has here, if we look, it has a name and so forth, but there's no country listed. It asks for the country, so it has to be in here. Where's the country? Right? Wyoming is either a state or province, or WI is, but it's not the country, so what's the country? So I wanted to put it in. And see, this got that same number, OMB number, right? Form. Dot, dot. So that's all the same. It's supposed to be the same. But it isn't, because where it says borrower's name on this other form, it had all these you know, separate blocks. Borrower's name, street address, city and town. Well, this one doesn't have that. It just has the borrower's name. And so they're saying that this whole thing here is the borrower's name. Which you would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But we'll just continue on, right? That Let's just do what it says. It said, put the borrower's name. That's in the box acts asked for and nothing else. Now, it's altered. And there should be other boxes to put the other information in because it said the same thing here, borrower's name. But then it had a different place for the street and the city and this other form doesn't have it. So somebody altered the form, called the IRS. You know, it's, it's a tax evasion crime. And uh, right, so here then it has seven. If address of property security mortgage is the same as payers, borrower's address, the box is checked, or the address or description is entered in box eight. Well, the box isn't checked. And then what's entered in box eight, it's got the same street number, but the A and the B come after, right? Like the second line. And here they have it the first line. Well, they did the same thing up here. You know, I don't know what this was exactly. If this is, if that's what showed up in the window of the envelope. But uh, it's an improper address. Okay, and uh, there is no property, but according to the uh, instructions we'll look at in a second, if there's only one property, there doesn't have to be a number there. Well, let's look at those instructions, because what did it say about box seven? It said, if the address of the property securing the mortgage is the same as the payer borrower's address, either the box has been checked or eight has been completed. Well, these aren't the same addresses. Can't make them the same. And this box hasn't been checked. Because this isn't the address that's on the anything to do with the borrower. And the other thing is that the, this really isn't the borrower's name. I mean, to get right down to the detail. Right? According to the deed of trust, the borrower is uh, Kimberly R. Price, comma, an unmarried woman. Well, they can't change that and just say, no, that isn't it. It's going to give it to somebody else, which was Kimberly R. Price, but, you know, it didn't have the addition on there, so it's not the same. No, 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 no. Don't, don't accept it. Right? Whatever name is on your um, uh, deed of trust is the name that needs to be on there. 
Or they're saying, well, we're not talking about the borrower. Now we're talking the payer. Well, why would I pay something I didn't, you know, unless it's because I'm the borrower. You're either the payer or you're the borrower. It's like two different offices. I guess I haven't dug deep enough to see what the differences would be. But there's that's the only reason to have something with a slash like that. Right? Like you're like you could be paying for the borrower, but you're not the borrower. Which is uh, probably more what's happening. So I think that this right here, what this is, because this is what they put in for the borrower's name. This is like your they call it a street address. It's almost like a brokerage um Tied to a brokerage account or something like that. But what I know is it's not the same as this dress, address here. So, hey, it's not the same. And the, the thing said either check the box or put the proper address. And this address don't match that address. You didn't check the box. So, you got to do it over. And you got to put the country. See, this is the other thing. This says country here. Now, let's go back and look at this one. They got to do the same thing for you. What's my country? City or town, state or province, country, and zip or foreign postal code. I believe that Israel uses the same postal code we do. You know, five, a five digit and a plus four. So unless it says what country it is, you could be sending your money to Israel. Not even know it. Wouldn't that be something? So, you know, before we leave this and go on to other things, just to look one more time, right? This form is wrong. It's been altered. It's an OMB form. It's got a rev number on it, right? It's got a rev. You can't change the damn form and say it came from the fucking IRS. This did not come from the IRS. This came from the IRS, right? The form's been altered. Somebody needs to call the IRS and, uh, you know, complain. Everybody that's get one, one of these should call the IRS and complain. Say, they've altered your form. Let me send you a copy of it. Right? I mean, every federal building has got an IRS office. You know, fax it to them. Find out how to get them a copy. Say, this is uh, lender fraud. Why? Well, because they changed your damn form, sir. Right? So, I mean, there's uh, fraud in the IRS form. There's fraud saying that you gave me a commitment. Never happened, right? Fraud, fraud, fraud. It's all over the place. So, um, yeah, hang on a second. Let me close a few things up and regroup. And we'll go and look at the other documents that we found that were wrong in this uh, package of stuff that came from the lender. And I'm not going to spend much time talking about this yet, but um, at the federal, the state, and in this particular case in Houston, at the local level, they've made the Fair Housing Act a law, or in this case, it's an ordinance, right? It was added to Chapter 17 of the ordinances uh, for the city of Houston is this thing talking about fair housing. But it's actually at national, state, and in this case, local level. So, uh, you know, you can complain to HUD about it. That's my point. And it says that it's a city policy. Uh, it's a policy of the city of Houston to promote housing opportunities for all persons. Such policies established upon recognition of rights of each individual to obtain housing without regard to race, color, religion, sex, national origin, status, disability, or further and further that uh, such right through considerations based on those things is uh, constitutes an unjust denial or deprivation of such rights. Good enough for me. So I don't have to know which ones those are. All I need to know is, well, they won't give me the damn legal title. That's discrimination. That's, uh, you know, a violation of the Fair Housing Act. And they should go investigate and tell me which one of these is the reason they didn't give it to me. I don't need to know. All I need to know is I've been deprived of the right to have a home because I don't have the legal title. Right? That's the whole thing. It has nothing to do with the deed of trust or the warranty deed or these other documents. It's the legal title, the freaking map. Let me show you one. It would look something like this, where you have this whole thing is closed in in a box. Right? And then it says how big that the territory is, the land in the box. Right? So all closed in. 
says how big the lots are, says where it's located, and then over here, Right? It says who the owner is. You ain't got one of these, you ain't the owner. And this shows that it's been filed. So technically, somebody else owns the homeowner's property, according to Bowden Survey, who did the survey. Now, we found a survey in the lender's documents, but it was for a borrower, not for an owner. Right? And this specifically says the owner. Owner. You ain't got something like this. You ain't the owner. And they use a particular name for it. And I have it highlighted in one of these documents. Hopefully I'll remember to talk about it when I see it. So hang on again. So when the homeowner got the list from the lender, it's, I don't know, it was 200 pages, but it was pretty dang close. And you start going through them and you, know, you find all sorts of stuff. Just, but here's just a few of them. You know, what, the one thing you don't find is you don't find a loan agreement signed by both you and the lender. There isn't one. Well, then it could never have been a loan because that's a business transaction. And so both parties have to sign a bilateral contract. Duh. And I and uh, pay attention to the fact that this is now the state of Texas, not just state of Texas, but the state of Texas. And it's the county of Harris, not Harris County. So they are running these two different jurisdictions side by side. You got one that says it's the uh, state of Texas, Harris County, and this one says it's the state of Texas, County of Harris. Well, you know, so one is de jure, one's de facto. One's with the union, and one's with the uh, uh, under the democracy. Something like that. Let's just read a little bit. So, we understand as obligor on the note made in connection with the mortgage loan, the mortgage loan, being submitted by the applicants under the department's taxable mortgage purchase program and or mortgage credit certificate program. So, let's just stop. Whatever we're doing has gone through two different, or at least one or the other, of these two state agencies. I, don't, I guess I don't know what the mortgage credit certificate program is, but I can tell the department's taxable mortgage purchase program. We're talking about the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. So they have the records for all this stuff. If there's been a loan made, they have it. And they give a servicer's loan number. So uh, we'll be doing a little bit more research on this next week, but, you know. Whatever happened, they had something to do with it. And the, so the first time we complained, they said they had nothing to do with, uh, through the Fair Housing Act, we went to them and complained, and they came back and said they had nothing to do with it. And so we uh, rebutted, and all of a sudden they said, okay, well now we've sent it to the place it's supposed to be, without saying who it went to. And we're still trying to get that answer. But anyways, you know, the note and the mortgage loan. So where's the damn paper? Uh, but it's, now it's Price, Kimberly R., where it says last name, first name, middle. It didn't say middle initial. It said middle name. And there's only one comma. So really they're saying that uh, this applicant's first name is Kimberly R. Right? That's her first name. Which is the same thing they do in the military. That's exactly what like they do in the military. You know. I went into the uh, MEP station as Rutluski, Robert Allen, but every order I ever got in the military is Rutluski, Robert A. The exact same thing. So that's a, you know, you could say, and I have, and I'm going to show this in another video, that's a disability. You took my fucking name from me. All right, it's a legal disability. I can no longer contract because you took my name. Uh, we further certify we have no other financial ownership interest in the property subject to the mortgage loan and that we have no intention to and will not occupy the property subject to the mortgage loan as permanent primary residence. 
Well, that's fucked up. That's where you're buying the place, just to live in it. But you just said you're not. Right? That's what they'd like you to believe. Because this is for the co-signer guarantor. It's not for the person living there, although it's that's why this name is different. Right? It's like you being your own co-signer in a different name. Because the Bauer isn't Price, comma, Kimberly R. It's Kimberly R. Price, comma, an unmarried woman. Seems to be some sneaky shit going on here. Okay, so there's one. You know, there's something to gripe about. Uh, warranty deed preparation acknowledgement. Well, isn't that interesting? Now, this loan number isn't the same as the loan numbers we've seen other places. This is like the last four of the loan number of what uh, this closing document said the loan number was. But, uh, you know, it's not the same. But it goes on to say now that this uh, Polunsky Biddle and Green LLP has prepared a warranty deed in vendor's lien, uh, with vendor's lien to the lender, our client, for their instructions. Notify them if there's a special provision of sales agreement. You are hereby advised, seek whatever legal counsel. Undersigned acknowledges I have read. Well, Kimberly never acknowledged it, so it never happened as far as she's concerned. They did do this, but she's never had a chance to review it. You know, that's what the record shows. So, you know, that's in our favor. We'll, we'll keep that one in our hand. And then there was an errors and omissions agreement. Here's the more full number. And they were using 3628 on the paper from the attorney firm. We're going to get back to them again in another document here in just a second. Uh, the undersigned Bowers are uh, consideration for for them granting something, right? Uh, talking about errors and omissions. And uh, granting borrowers a mortgage and dispersing the funds on the above reference loan agrees to the following. Well, again, this isn't the borrower. Right? There's no comma on unmarried woman. And that's what's on the deed of trust. That's what they said the borrower's name is. So that's the borrower's name. Either that or this is right and the deed of trust is wrong. But in either case, the same uh, attorney firm wrote them both. Okay. Well, what do you got there? Well, look at whatever it is. They're a big blank spot. Let's see what this is supposed to be. Uh, there's that loan number again, so we must be talking to the attorney firm, right, that has the wrong borrower, no comma, an unmarried woman, but this is the representation notice. So this would have come first, before the, you know, the warranty deed was the fact they're noticing you that they're going to write the warranty deed, which is what they're going to do. The undersigned acknowledged the preparation of certain instruments, warranty deed, uh, deed of trust, by this firm here at this address, or so they say, but when you go look them up, there is no firm named Polunsky Biddle Green LLP uh, registered with the Secretary of State. There's a Polunsky Biddle LLP, but until they prove they have a an assumed name certificate to do it under this name, then, you know, Polunsky Biddle Green LLP is not registered. Which is exactly the same thing that's happening here, where they're trying to tell us that this person is registered because, well, here's a License number you can look up that has the name Lisa blah 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 Alonzo blah 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 comma Ms. or Mrs. as the certificate holder. But then it has a place for well, what other names does she use and none of them are Lisa Alonzo. Right? They, they want you to agree that these are names that are being used and are proper, but they're not. Lisa Alonzo isn't on the license for this license number that it would take you to. And Polunsky Biddle Green LLP isn't registered with the Secretary of State. By uh, the execution of the, deed of the deed by seller and acceptance thereof by Bauer, well, there you go, accept the deed. I've been saying that for years. Right? And they're saying it. you got to accept the deed. But they don't have any place on the deed for you to do it. And uh, 
people that have done it, it's not worked the way it was supposed to. So, yeah, okay, you didn't acknowledge the deed, then there is no deed. Because this paper is blank, right? There's nothing here. The undersigned further acknowledges, you know, the, the undersigned is doing all sorts of things, but there's nobody undersigned. Until you go to the second page where, you know, this little blurb here could have just as easily fit in right here. Because they actually push this down on the paper. That should be up higher on the paper. So there's plenty. My point is, there's plenty of room to have all this one page, and they didn't do it that way intentionally. So again, this isn't the Bauer, because the Bauer is Kimberly R. Price, comma, unmarried woman, according to these people who wrote the fucking deed and the uh, uh, deed of trust. Okay, continuing on with the Bauer that doesn't quite exist. Uh, notice of no oral agreements. The written loan agreement represents the final agreement between the parties. Well, excellent. Where is it? Because it's between the parties. This means both parties would have had to sign the agreement and may not be contradicted by evidence of prior, contemporaneous, or subsequent oral agreements of the parties. Excellent. There are no unwritten oral agreements between the parties. Now, Note, uh, receipt of notice, the undersigned hereby represents warrants, received and read a copy of this notice before the execution of loan agreement. Okay, because we haven't seen it yet, so it's okay to have signed this because we haven't seen it yet. But yeah, we're doing it beforehand. The loan agreement means one or more promises, promissory notes, agreements, undertakings, security agreements, Deeds of trust or other documents or commitments or any combination of these or documents pursuant. These uh, actions or documents pursuant to which the financial institution loans or delays repayment of an agreed to loan or delay repayment of money, goods, other thing, value. Otherwise, extend credit. Okay, where's the damn paper? Because there really isn't a promissory note. There is a thing called a note, but it doesn't say it's a promissory note, so it's not a note, promissory note. You know, a promissory note has to have certain elements in, and I don't know that what they call a note has them, but I can tell you they don't call it a note, or a promissory note, they just call it a note. But whatever it is, it has to be agreement between the parties. So where is the other one? Me just giving something to you with my name on it is a gift or a donation. It's not an agreement. The only way that could be an agreement is for you to acknowledge the deed that you agree to take it, the gift. But in business, you can't do that anyways. You can't have gifts or donations. It has to be a bilateral business contract. Never happened. Okay, and then purchaser, right, this is one page, kind of all by itself, that said, uh, please complete the following information for mailing your title policy, document copy, so she filled it out. But on the uh, purchase agreement, they have a place to put this information. I think it's like block 21 of the agreement between the buyer of the property and the seller of the property. And they didn't put this in there. They just put an email address, and then they sent her, a document that says it's a commitment, but it was never signed by them. So, you know, they just sent her evidence of a crime is all it was. And this is quite telling. Uh, whatever it is, is missing pages one and two. What it is, it's HUD documentation. HUD forms. And we can see direct endorsement approval for the HUD FHA insured mortgage. Well, it was never approved and nobody ever signed. And nobody ever signed, and nobody ever signed, and this is page three. So this is uh, HUD 92900-A, which we could look up and we could find out what the first two pages are, and I may do that in a second, but let's continue on. Again, it's, that's not the borrower's name. Where's the comma? An unmarried woman. That's what you put on the deed of trust and the warranty deed, and apparently that's who it is. Uh, but this was signed, right? So on the last page now, this is page four. I don't know if it's the last page, but it was the last page in this group. It's the mortgagee's certification, and that would be the lender. 
So the lender says, I personally reviewed the mortgage documents and application for insurance endorsement, and this mortgage is complete, complies with SF Handbook 4001, Section 2A7, post closing endorsement. Well, I have to go look at that and see exactly what that says, because I can't believe that, you know, empty pages comply with anything. I certify the statements above are materially correct. So the statements above is, well, nobody signed. So there was no freaking loan. Right? Because this was signed by somebody, or they're saying it was. Well, they can explain all this to the Texas uh, Financial Division. How come this is this way? And that'll all be part of another video. And then there's this uh, T47 residential real property affidavit. You know, so this is a Texas form, which maybe they could alter this. I mean, I don't know if they can or not, but what I know is uh, it wasn't signed by anybody, not sworn to, not subscribed. And they're trying to make it like Kimberly did, but this is on a separate piece of paper, right? they they intentionally, you know, do it this way so that they can bump it down and put the just the signature block on another piece of paper. They can put in there whatever they want to put in or take out whatever they want to take out, which is kind of what they're doing. And I guess lastly on this, then I'm going to show you somebody else's paperwork to show that, you know, these errors are not just in one person's, they're probably in every person's. But this has to do with that attorney firm, right, where... Uh, I looked online, and I said, well, there is no Plitsky Beetle, whatever that third name was. And so uh, the homeowner got a hold of the company, and they sent this and said, well, here it is. It's right here, right, which is Plitsky Beetle, not. Uh, where are you? Not Polinsky Beetle Green LLP. Right, so they're not the same until they can prove they're the same. But one thing is, they don't have listed a uh, registered agent. It's like, well, you have to have a registered agent. How can you not have a registered agent listed? Or you're supposed to be a corporation. They tell them having a certificate of assumed name and uh, registration limited liability partnership. You know, do they? I don't know. All I know is uh, they have to prove it because this isn't the name that's on the paperwork. So until they prove it, they're not the, you know, it's not the people that they say they are. They're just impersonating them. Okay, here's what I was looking for earlier is uh, the company has approved the current land title survey. In Texas, you want to ask for land title survey. Talk to the surveyor. I want a land title survey. I want the one that has my name on it when you're done. How do we get that one? All right, because it's a special kind. There's all sorts of surveys. You got borrower survey and you got uh, owner survey. You want the owner survey. Okay, we're going to move on now. I just wanted to show you that's uh, what happened with this, where we've already filed a small claim against the real broker LLC. Uh, we're now looking at these documents with uh, the lender and uh, are going to go through the state, show that in another video um, as the finance side, but also go through under the fair housing uh, complaint window, see what happens there. And uh, nothing so far with the University of Tonic Company, but they're, they're coming. They'll be next. But what I did want to show you is somebody else's um, documents. So, yeah, hang on just a second here. This is a purchase agreement uh, for buying a house in Arizona. And, um, you know, this is what you're buying. So anything else that doesn't say this, then you say, well, that's not what I bought. This is what I bought. And this says you're buying home site 104 in the community, Moonlight at Royal Ranch, uh, PCL, I guess that's probably for parcel three. The address of which is, and they give some address and uh, so forth. So, you know, to tie this 
address the way you see it here with anything other than this would alert you that, well, you're not charging me for what I bought. And, uh, you know, this isn't the, so my point is that this home site and community isn't ever used again uh, in the documentation. Then they go to something else to do with the, and we'll see in a second, however they decide to describe it on other documents, what the legal description is. But this is the legal description of what you bought. And then it says the purchase price. The purchase price and payment terms of this transaction are set forth in the RNI, which is a receipt and information document that this up here it said that this contract, the receipt and information supplement and construction order, right, make up the entire agreement. Uh, earnest money deposit and so forth and so on. And the escrow, going to do it through this thing called the talent group, right? They're the escrow agent. So they're playing the same part. Then the disclosing, the, the settlement agent, right? Here it was Universal Title Company. And uh, in this case, it's a place called the talent group. Now, uh, real quick before we go any further. Well, let's look at the purchase price, right? So that's really that all that's of any interest. The other thing, here it is, a receipt and uh, information supplement. And it says it was paid for in cash. There is no loan, right? So there's no way to tie a mortgage to this because there is no loan. This property was paid in cash according to the seller. Now it says mooning, uh, moonlight at Royal Ranch 3, parcel 3. Is that the same as this other one? Moonlight at Royal Ranch. Oh, by gosh, it's the same place. That was paid for in cash. There is no loan. There's no VFA or F FHA, VA, or conventional. It's just cash, C-A-S-H. Uh, but the buyer was... Uh, the guy in his uh, middle initial name and uh, and his wife and uh, her not full legal name. I don't think they even had a middle name in, in for her. We're on here. I'm not really sure. Uh, that's a seller. Closing, uh, buyer and seller agree that escrow will not close until the city of Surprise has issued a certificate of occupancy. I wonder if that ever happened. Talent group, they're the ones on the hook. Additional documents, uh, acknowledge receipt of articles of incorporation of Royal Ranch, something or other, bylaws of Royal Ranch, architectural something or other, Royal Ranch. So there's some other documents to look at that go along with this uh, purchase agreement, but so be it. But I don't see why anybody ever signed this. Four, three, two. Right, was there any place for the homeowner to sign? I guess they signed here. I guess we could say they signed. Okay, anyways, but that's what, they, that's what they're buying. But that isn't what's used on other documents. Like on the deed of trust, now they have him in his full legal name. All right, so this is the bower here, right? This whole thing right here. Uh, man's name, a married man. Woman's name, full legal name, a married woman. That whole thing, that's the borrower. That's not what they use in any other documents. And then it goes on to say, somewhere here we should have us, uh, yeah, right, no parcel number given. This is supposed to be transfer rights of property. Being more particularly described by legal description attached here too, right, which is page 16, this PDF. So we're on page 3. Let's just quick go see what that had to say. Right? It's lot 104, correct? The flat Royal Ranch unit parcel 3. Well, that had nothing to do with what was on the purchase agreement, which was uh, home site 104, community moonlight at Royal Ranch parcel 3. 
It's got a different legal description, completely different legal description, where you could say, well, that's not what I bought. I'm not paying anything on that one. But then they went on, they're supposed to get some more information, and they didn't put a parcel number. And there's, you know, there's no, there's no parcel number given. And uh, but then we got some street now that's west with the west cap or the whole west, not just a W. Drive, you know, not a DR. So all that stuff matters if we're looking at these things, and we have to see how they all fit together. But uh, that's what the deed of trust is on, and that's not what he bought. So. You know, it's not the same. How about the warranty deed? I think it's the same thing where it has it in their full legal names up here, but then here it has it in a middle initial name and no middle name and husband and wife. Now they're the grantee with this lot 104, right? Which isn't what's on the purchase agreement. All right, Moonlight at Royal Ranch. Parcel 3, well, that doesn't say that anywhere on here. It's not the same. It's not what you bought. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. What do you got over here? Fulton Home Title Company Disclosure. Were they, Fulton Homes even is telling the title company, this is the description. Right? Home site 104, actually 0104, Moonlight at Royal Ranch Parcel 3. That doesn't show up in anything else. And then I uh, went into some other stuff. But you get the idea. If you if you ask for these documents, and the way you get them is starting with this closing disclosure, right? And you go to the lender, you go to the broker, you go to the real estate agent or the settlement agent. And if it's been a long time ago, then uh, maybe it's just a settlement agent. But you're still... Somebody's still servicing your loan, so somebody has the information, and you know you just need to get it and start looking for it and find something that's wrong. But back to the beginning, right? But more than likely, you've already gotten this thing for this year, and it's wrong. And so you know you need to go complain that it's wrong. You need to file a complaint with the IRS that it's wrong. You need to send it back to the Lender and tell them it's wrong. Say you're not accepting this. And you need to send them a W-9 and say, I need your W-9 to have them fill it out. <laughs> right? You need their taxpayer information. Because they say this is their taxpayer ID, but how do I know this form is wrong? Right? This is the way it comes to the IRS. And it's got an OMB number on it. And it's got a style, or not a style number, but a format. Revision number. And this one's claiming to be that, it's, uh, you know, revision one, 2022, form 1098. Well, no, you're not. This is it. And if this was it, it would have a place for the street address, the city and so forth. And then they would have to put your country. They'd have to say you're in the United States. Same here. Where are you at? Because they don't put it on there. And you accept it and go pay it. Well, now you're just the payor instead of the borrower. You're just paying for somebody else because they made you do it. I don't know if everybody's address is different than this, but I would ask, right, if you have this, that you, uh, you know, send me a copy to my email address. Right? What did you get in the mail? And then I'll do a whole bunch of them on, you know, I'll blank them out like this so we're not showing too much, but then I'll show them in our video and say, look, this, these are all wrong. And so if you would, if you could uh, send them to court of record at AOL.com, you know, I'll put them on, uh, if I get a handful of them, I'll put them on a video. But that's it for this video, right? Because the IRS Form 1098 is being used in lender deception. It's not the only thing, right? You get the lender documents, you're going to find all sorts of things. But because it's been altered, it's tax evasion. Well, you know, time to get the Treasury involved. Call in the Treasury agents. Let's put an end to this stuff. Excellent. Uh, you all have a great rest of your Sunday. And uh, I got some other videos to do on different subjects. But I wanted to get this one done and get caught up as close as I could. 
and we'll see what happens next. Y'all have a great day. See you now.